Many great minds have speculated about the possibility of life in higher or extra dimensions, but only the late great Douglas Adams recognized the difficulty of going to war with them, unless of course someone could walk out a way to fire missiles at right angles to reality. So welcome to another Sci-Fi Sunday here on SFIA where we try to examine concepts in science fiction and look at what the science has to say about them. Today we're going to be discussing the concept of life in higher dimensions. I'd imagine that for a lot of folks that conjures either the idea of an extra physical dimension or two, or perhaps many, or alternatively, some higher or lower planes of existence. I'll focus on extra physical dimensions but we will be discussing both today and the reason why, as we'll explain, is that the two are almost inextricably linked. Because what we really mean is a place where physics operates differently, and gravity for instance works very differently if your universe has four physical dimensions and not three, while concepts like entropy or energy conservation really shouldn't exist in your typical heaven-like higher reality as portrayed in many a religion or in various sci-fi with spiritually ascended entities who have risen to a higher plane of existence. That higher plane is assumed to have different rules, ones better than here that you might wish to migrate to. So one of the questions we're asked today is if it is possible to move to a higher dimension, and if it's worth the trip, what those benefits might be. At the same time, this video is not focused on discussing Ascended Alien Life much, we already did that in our Aloof Aliens episode, though there's more worth discussing than fit in there. So too, we're not really trying to look at afterlife scenarios, except in a resource availability standpoint, as I felt that more properly blonde in its own episode, Artificial Afterlives, that will come out later this week, June 15, 2023. And if you want to alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit those like, subscribe, and notification buttons. In order to ask what life in a 4D or 5D universe would be like, we should take a moment to ask about 2D life. The excellent classic book Flatland helps us to see just some of the problems life might have in that realm, and it's been a topic given lots of speculative discussion for years since then, but a few years back James Scargill of UC Davis gave it a more detailed and mathematical analysis and makes a compelling case that it might be possible. But there are all sorts of problems with physical forces and effects that tend not to be intuitive, beginning with how easy it is to essentially logjam almost anything, since a single line across a sheet is a wall of effectively infinite height and depth, you have to go around it. Things collide far more easily too, moving in 2D, whereas in 4D or 5D various particles bouncing around are far less likely to run into each other. Given that most chemistry and physics involve stuff bumping into each other, something that makes that far less common tends not to make more complex emergent properties like biology all that probable in higher dimensions. We also need to ask what exactly a dimension really is. So what is a dimension? Well, most folks know we've got the three physical ones and the one for time, and they know there's some connection between those making space-time all one, also that there's talk about us really living in 10 dimensions, or 11 or 26, but somehow those ones are practically undetectable to us or super tiny, and maybe made of strings or something. That can seem really confusing, but it must be true, because theoretical physics says the math checks out, though just as an FYI, physics does not. It's just a lot of physicists and mathematicians feel having some extra dimensions that were ultra tiny would explain the universe better, but there is no actual proof or evidence of these other dimensions. It's critical to string theory, most versions of which call for 9 physical and 1 temporal dimension, bosonic string theory calls for 26, and their cousin, M theory, calls for 11 dimensions. And they are very compelling mathematical cases. But what is a dimension? Well, in math it can be lots of things. For instance, if I'm a park ranger tracking my deer population, I might make a graph showing how many deer there were by apparent weight, giving me two dimensions, quantity and weight. Those can't presumably go all the way out to infinity, there's no specific boundary, but we might add a third dimension to the chart, which had antlers and which did not. That's a specific state, yes or no, there's no in-between, it's a very compact dimension. We could leave it open to infinity by making a dimension for antler length instead, or widen it but keep it discrete by going by how many points the deer's antlers had, and we can keep adding more dimensions till we have hundreds. We might also have a dimension that is circular, 
much like Latitude and Longitude are, or a color wheel, and you could have a dimension for color, in a graph that's an inventory of how many objects were what shade. Now modern physics does not recognize the 10 or 11 or 26 dimensions of string theory and its cousins, even if theories are popular among theorists and well thought out, but it does recognize the three physical ones and time, the four dimensions of Minkowski spacetime. Hermann Minkowski, incidentally, was one of Einstein's teachers and his work in the early 20th century is critical to relativity. It was at about this time we had our first discussions of adding another dimension to unify physical forces, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Physics also recognizes seven basic units, which are length, time, mass, electric current, temperature, luminous intensity, and amount of substance. From these seven units you can create any other units in physics, for instance speed is length divided by time, and the unit of weight is mass times length divided by time squared. Anything in our universe should be entirely measurable in one of those units or combination thereof, in a physical sense anyway, we can give a color in terms of its photon wavelength or frequency or energy and brightness, loosely speaking. Colors are fundamentally a human concept based on our optics, biology, and brains, and not all colors have an equivalent wavelength, like magenta, but it works well enough for an example. However, something like how pleasing it is to the senses can be measured, but not in any direct or obvious combination of those basic units, and you could think of them as dimensions in a general sense as well, since you could chart them for any given object. And the word dimension derives from Latin for measuring or to measure out, and came to mean bulk, size, extent, or capacity sometime in the 16th century. In the early 20th century, dimension also came to mean any component of a situation, but this is not really what is being discussed when physicists and mathematicians talk about dimensions. We usually mean physical space and time, but I feel it is worth keeping in mind that you could have other dimensionalities besides those in a different universe or plane, or even analogs for space and time in which neither existed. But the extra dimensions of string theory are not quite the physical extra dimensions folks tend to expect. As I mentioned a moment ago, we could have a dimension that only had two components, up and down or left and right, something very compacted with only two states, or only a thousand maybe, but we usually mean two or three. Imagine a piece of paper, this is actually a three-dimensional object with thickness, but for the purpose of demonstration we can consider it to be two-dimensional, except that it has a front and back, and if you are a letter or image on that paper, you are either on the front or back, not plus two front or minus 1.5 back. A or B, positive or negative, right or left, up or down, only two states, but those states still exist. So the 2D paper is actually 3D, two normal physical dimensions, but one compacted physical dimension as well. In the same way, by folding that paper into a circle, we can make an object that is 3D, and is irregular in one dimension, compacted in another, a loop in another. Now even before relativity there was a lot of speculation about additional dimensions, indeed it was a fairly common reason given in some magic shows for impossible deeds in the late 19th century and had a lot of credence with many scientists at the time, some fourth dimension we couldn't see but which things could move through, though not to be confused with something like an astral plane, subspace, fey realm, underworld, or shadow realm that we typically would treat as a higher or lower plane or universe, rather than just an extra dimension. While the topic got a lot more rigorous heading into the 20th century, it definitely had roots in the mystic and has remained popular in that and sci-fi, though often gets a bit ambiguous about details. Which is understandable, the math on higher dimensions works fine but visualizing it is hard. If I'm looking at a circle on a piece of paper, that is an image of an object, I can't really say if that object is a sphere or a cylinder or a cone or quite a few less simple shapes. Same for if a four-dimensional object was protruding into our reality. You've heard of Tesseracts, they were popularized by Marvel Comics movies and made an appearance as an alien probe in Threshold, a short-lived sci-fi show from 2005, produced by Brandon Braga and with Peter Dinklage and Brent Spiner in it, good little gem of a show that had lots of room for improvement but which I would like to have seen to get a second season. Nothing mystical about a tesseract, it's a simple object that is the same length on every side, like a square or a cube, but it's got one more side. 
you'll see animations of them that are very kaleidoscopic and don't really make you think hyperdimensional cube, but if you look at a cube sometime from different 2D angles, it doesn't really resemble a square unless you're up close and look at it straight on from one side, or you close your eyes to remove your depth perception. A tesseract turned at the right angle just looks like a cube. Similarly, a 4D object protruding into our space looking like a sphere might have other dimensions drawing out something more cylindrical, or it might be a very compacted fourth dimension, so that it is to a sphere what a piece of paper is to a square or rectangle, or it might be an object with an equal radius in all directions, a hyposphere. I could see looking at one being rather disorienting, but there's no special reason it should drive you insane. If you were walking around on a cube-shaped planet or construct, it would have six faces, two for each dimension, just like with dice. But a tesseract or four cube actually has eight cubes for its surface, much as a square has four lines for its surface. On each corner of a 2D square you have two lines, each going in one of two directions. On a 3D cube, each corner has three lines, each a line going in one of three directions, and is where three perpendicular squares meet up. For a four cube that becomes four perpendicular cubes, meeting at three corners with four lines, extending in one of each four directions. What would be disorienting is moving around one or watching someone do it, and this is the basis for a lot of talk about moving through higher dimensions in sci-fi, and again mysticism, because if you live on one square surface of a cube, watching someone walk off the edge and disappear, then appear from another side shortly afterward seems like teleportation, but they just stored around one of those other hidden faces. Notice that doing this doesn't magically shorten your trip, it actually gets longer, which is why proper analogies about using higher dimensions as shortcuts, like wormholes in hyperspace, generally involve drilling through a piece of paper or folding the paper up with two points on a map to touch, or to jump into some congruent space that's smaller, but it does allow you to teleport and to avoid passing through a space. You jump over a wall or line, which you can do in 3D but not in 2D, which would let you do handy tricks like walk through an impenetrable castle wall or shield by just walking around it. A great way to deliver weapon systems like missiles through defenses. The problem is that a lot of things break down in higher dimensions. You can certainly have a force sphere equivalent of a planet for instance, but gravity falls off far faster. For instance, in Earth-Moon Parallel, gravity out where the moon was would be considerably weaker, and it would have been harder for planets to form in that weaker gravity but just as importantly, it is hard to make a stable orbit in higher dimensions. The higher you go, the more minor perturbation would destabilize your orbit. Move 10% closer in 3D and gravity is 121% stronger, but in 4D it's 131% stronger, in 10D 260% stronger, so again a minor change in distance is far more perturbative in higher dimensions. In a 2D universe, we expect gravity to weaken in force to distance, so something twice as far away experiences half the gravity, while in our normal 3D universe it's half squared or a quarter, and in a 4D universe it's half cubed or an eighth, etc. such that the 10D universe at double the distance would have gravity weakened to less than a thousandth of what it was. Again, that means the higher you go dimensionally, the harder it is for a radiating force like gravity to allow objects to have stable orbits. This also translates to other forces like electromagnetism, which is also an inverse square force in 3D. This isn't helped by situations like sunlight falling off in that same fashion, so the planet further away has drastically less light. These don't help your odds for finding a 4D planet equivalent that's habitable over long periods, but it gets worse. Our sun radiates its sunlight in the frequency it does because the density in the core causes fusion at a rate that is balanced by our sun's size and temperature. Very tiny changes in the core's density will seriously alter the brightness and lifetime of the star, so much so that a difference in mass by a factor of around 100 can cause a lifetime difference of a million and a brightness difference of a billion, and that's in our own 3D Universe. But something like heat transfer by particles whacking each other or radiating into the vacuum ought to be far higher, making for a faster rate of surface cooling. Alternatively, because such a universe is 4D, its density for things smacking into each other ought to be less too. Imagine a Big Bang in 2D, but with the same number of particles. Once a space has grown to be a billion light years wide, 
or billion billion square light years, it's now a millionth as dense as it was back when it was a region a million light years wide. That same region in 3D is a billion times less dense, and in 4D, a trillion, 5D, a quadrillion, and so on. So the time available for matter to clump and plants and life to form before the place gets too spread out is small, and those unstable orbits don't give those plants much time to cook up life and allow it to become spacefaring. And yet there's nothing about that situation that really implies chemistry is going any faster, especially as ultimately the power pumps for life in this universe are the residual heat of forming under gravitational collapse, which would appear to be less common and weaker, and cool off faster, the tidal heating of planets or moons near you, which are inherently unstable, and the light from your sun, which has a much shorter range, and thinner habitable bands where the Goldilocks zone stays almost just right. And the chemistry would get way different too, we can't really assume the normal forces exist in higher dimensions, indeed they might be emergent properties of 3 space specifically, but an electromagnetic bond is weaker with distance just like gravity, which is bound to impact which molecules are stable and have what properties, and it won't be any of the ones we're used to. This probably hits just as bad the atomic and subatomic scales, but what it means is that you are stepping into a 4D universe you would probably instantly die. In Stephen Baxter's novel Raft, we see a group of humans that accidentally entered an alternate universe that is 3D, but where the gravitational force is a billion times stronger, not that implausible considering even the weakest of the other three fundamental forces is a trillion trillion times stronger than gravity. There are no planets because they'd instantly collapse into black holes, and stars are very short-lived and only a mile across, cooling to semi-livable bodies a few hundred meters across with five times normal Earth gravity. In this sort of universe, gravity has a real impact on actual chemistry, rather than its normal role of essentially contributing to temperature and pressure. And that's still the same three dimensions, just one force change to be stronger. We can always hand wave some sort of field that somehow lets you stay 3D in a 4D universe, like something that lets a 2D person from a paper universe exist in ours, but it is really hand wavy. The alternative is that we already live as a paper equivalent in a 4D universe. If you imagine a statue of a person made of paper sheets, any given sheet of that paper is not terribly lifelike, a cross section of a foot, your stomach, or whichever, and if those weren't paper but actual 2D universes intersecting with one of us, folks living in that 2D space wouldn't really get that they were just a tiny cross-section of us, less than a tiny bit of gut bacteria. This is usually the analogy for 4D life, that if we encountered an example of such an organism, it is probably because we are living in a 3D slice of the entity. And I want to emphasize, we don't really know from a science perspective what the odds are of life evolving under different physical constants or dimensions is, because it's too big of a problem and with only math modeling to guess from, not observational data, and you really need the latter for it to be science. There are some strong arguments that 3D is uniquely suited to life because a cell is possible with a certain surface area to volume ratio and it gets way off in 4D or 5D, and things like the square cube law for how objects scale up in 3D is very important to all sorts of biological and engineering considerations, and might not convert to higher dimensions or have a parallel equivalent there. It is popular to suggest we're in a fine-tuned universe where if any of the physical constants were just a little bit off then life would be impossible, but what it really means is that our type of life would be impossible, and indeed you might not be able to evolve in such a place but an artificial construct designed here for use there is an option, as is the statistical fluke alternative to Darwin, where something simply happened to randomly assemble at a very high level of complexity. We usually call that a Boltzmann brain, but we're assuming a human or higher level of intellect would be needed for it to be long-term stable or self-replicating in a non-natural environment, but that's pretty speculative too. Honestly, it's more about the idea you or I might be a Boltzmann brain randomly sprung into existence that is busy going slowly mad and hallucinating this life, or that we are both in a very deep dream of something bigger than us, dreaming us both up, which itself is either very bored, or crazy, or both. 
realistically some simple life form popping into existence with the ability to self-replicate and survive in its environment is still more likely than a large brain. So Boltzmann life popping in at a modest complexity and then evolving is also an option. In any event, there really are not very many universes I've heard proposed where I couldn't think of a way to make a switch of some sort, and if you can do that, you can presumably do a computer of some sort, and if you can do that, you should be able to have an intelligent mind or alien of some sort. And the odds of it occurring might be insanely low, but we have to be careful to assume the probabilities translate to other universes very well, which is much harder when we throw in extra dimensions. You can make a switch out of so many things, or a basic analogy to an atom or a molecule, even out of something like a black hole or a pair of them. If you're dealing with some old or high gravity universe where there would basically be nothing else remaining there but those. Consider a universe with a billion times the gravity we have, like in the novel Raft, which is one where black holes should form out of virtually any conglomeration of mass, and where we would expect a universe the same as ours, in other respects, to be very nearly all black holes by now, with plenty of other objects but all around the fringe and tiny, but probably still very numerous. The Schwarzschild radius, or event horizon in 3D, of a black hole goes with the gravitational constant and mass, so a billion times the gravitational constant and some stellar mass black hole is now as wide as our solar system, not the size of a small asteroid. But something only the mass of a modest asteroid should be able to turn into a smaller black hole. We believe black holes evaporate from Hawking radiation and that their lifetime goes with the cube of mass and square of the gravitational constant in a 3D universe, so they live a billion times longer at the same mass. In the right sort of universe, you might have the equivalent of basic hydrogen atoms be a pair of black holes. Or they might be your basic unit of power that everything at the bigger scale lives off of. Heck, we have decent theories around the idea that our universe is inside a four-dimensional black hole or that tiny little electrons are actually naked singularities themselves. But an example like us being a 3D slice of a four-dimensional universe, presumably with many other slices or pages like a book, that place probably has its own existing objects, maybe stars, maybe just an analogy to them, and we could potentially have our universe, or our spot in the universe, intersect with that and we'd never even know till it got us. A cataclysm akin to living on a 2D map and not realizing that there's a campfire nearby and some wind blowing. The good news is that unlike in a simulated reality, your higher levels here do not necessarily enjoy infinite power over you, and if they can interact with you, vice versa should be true. You ought to be able to affect that universe in some way, and from that, study it and assemble 4D or 5D or whatever objects and implant a mind into them, an adapted copy of a human or an AI. We also want to ask if we might want to colonize such places and I think that has to be attached to the reminder that we're not always necessarily talking one higher physical dimension, otherwise like all three. It might be a circular or compacted one, or it might be a second time dimension, something analogous to two and three dimensional space but for time, or a close parallel, like the address listing for alternate timelines. And a lot of those options imply pretty casual time travel, in the same teleportation context of the person living on one face of a cube while another can walk around the other faces. Or maybe not. After all, we can talk about time being just one more dimension, but much as gravity is just one more force, it is very unlike the other three. It only seems to flow one way, and you have very limited control of the rate at which you might move in it. That might hold even if you had three time dimensions, and it might not hold at all in a higher dimensional case. Fundamentally, if you can interact with them, you want to because if I'm a piece of paper in a 3D world, I can tap a vastly larger supply of everything that way, whether I'm adapting to go live in a higher dimension or just importing the upside. You might have a place you can open tiny portals up to and have raw energy pour out, or matter, or even elements that form rarely here but easily there, or not at all here but might stay put once formed. You might have a place time moved easily in each direction and you could dump entry in, flip the switch, and yank that matter back in a lower entropy state. 
The good news is that while we have plenty of reason to invade or colonize higher dimensions, aliens living there really have little reason to do the same to us, though they also have little reason not to take an interest in us or fear us. So they're not a great Fermi Paradox solution, since we would probably talk to a 2D world if we found one, and might expect a 4D civilization to talk to us. Ultimately, the really neat thing about higher dimensions is that there's literally entirely new directions to explore and make use of. So we recently finished up the International Space Development Conference in Dallas, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, but it was a really great chance to not just see huge developments in the field, but discuss them with others who share our knowledge and passion for space and technology. And that's also the goal for our episode sponsor, Keysight World Innovate, Keysight's virtual vision conference that takes place over three days in June. Starting June 20th through 22nd, the industry's best minds will take you behind the scenes of today's most exciting technologies to discover the future of what's possible, all in under two hours a day. On day one you'll get a true picture of how 5G and 6G will map the information superhighways of the metaphors to take us beyond gaming and transform daily life. On day two, go full speed into the cutting edge advancements in AI controlled or software defined vehicles and discover how lessons learned from auto racing can make autonomous driving safer. On day three, we cover non terrestrial networks and digital healthcare. On June 22nd, find out why extraterrestrial 6G is the final communications frontier and how AI driven devices are transforming healthcare beyond telehealth. Register now to explore a world of infinite possibilities. So I recently had the honor to co-host the National Space Society's International Space Development Conference in Texas, and I got a lot of great ideas for possible episodes from various presentations and conversations. We will pull those over on our community tab on YouTube over the next couple months so you can let me know what episodes you would like to see. One of the events we do there is display entries in our Gerard K. O'Neill Space Settlement Design Contest, and I'm glad to say we had over 350 international students at the ISDC giving presentations on their designs and over 26,000 entries from around the world. We also awarded the Werner Von Braun Prize to Dr. Eric Smith, who headed up the James Webb Telescope Project and shared some great insights into both Webb and what future telescopes might need to incorporate to take us beyond Webb. As a side note, the NSS was created by the merger of two groups, founded by O'Neill and Von Braun respectively, it's pretty awesome being president of the organization they founded, and those prizes in their honor, along with the Heinlein Prize, are our three highest awards. Also a special thanks to Ken Ruffin and the rest of our North Texas chapter for helping host this year's ISDC. Next year we'll be in Los Angeles, and I'll talk more about that event down the road, but the NSS has tons of events throughout the year, most virtual, in progress, getting added or under upgrade, and I'll also mention those more in future episodes. I will likely be heavily involved in production of those, given my experience at that, and if you're interested in being involved too, shoot me a message or email. Also for those keeping track, today's outro is the first episode segment I've recorded since my nose and tongue surgery. For my part I think I sound the same as before, but others have said I'm much clearer. Given that the main segment of the episode was recorded back in April, I'd be curious if anyone notices a difference. Alright, that will wrap us up for today, but join us again on Thursday to continue the conversation by looking at the possibility of using science and technology to create artificial afterlives. And next week we will have our 400th regular episode of SFIA, as we contemplate what life might be like in the year 2323 AD. Then we'll wrap up June with our monthly livestream Q&A on Sunday, June 25th, and then on Thursday, June 29th, we'll ask what Earth might be like if humanity disappeared. Then we'll head into July to discuss how and why we should mine or refine materials on the Moon. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.